here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. So our um, movie, and you don't have this, Kim, let me see if I can find it, said a scripture that came to my mind while that video was playing. Because so many times we just forget that God's there. We get caught up in this world. We believe a lie. We're deceived. We lose focus. We don't keep our focus on the author and perfecter of our faith. We think our Heavenly Father is not there, that He doesn't love us enough. And that's nothing new. David wrote about it. He said, I cried out to God, this is Psalm 77, for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I saw the Lord. At night I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. Where are you, Lord? I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I'm, I mused, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. Will the Lord reject forever? Will He never show His favor again? Has His unfailing love vanished forever? Has His promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has He in anger withheld His compassion? And see, that's the way the boy was not understanding life because he viewed it upside down. And he got to physically see that. He would go to reach out for something and it would be here, but he would reach there because he couldn't tell where it was. He'd go to lay down on the bed and want to jump up. Everything was upside down. But see, what you go on to read is, Then I thought, to this I will appeal, the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. That's why we're here today, to worship Him. He doesn't change. He is forever caring. He loves you no matter what. And He deserves to be praised. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great as our God. That's why we're here today. Because God is so good and He loves you. He loved you enough that He sent Jesus, His Son, to die to redeem you back. I have a confession to make. I sinned this week. Did you? <laughs> Let's see a show of hands. Did you sin this week? Okay, for those who didn't put up their hand, now put up your hand because you're a liar also. See, we are sinners, and we need a Savior. Problem is the world doesn't think that way. They think they can save themselves, or it doesn't matter, or it's all relevant, or any religion is okay. Good is good, bad is bad. But see, we all fall short of God's standard. That's why Jesus said, if you even think it in your heart, you've not kept the law. The law only points out that we are all sinners we all fall short of God's glory, and we deserve 
punishment. Punishment from the one, the severity related to the one that the crime was against. God Almighty. We deserve to be obliterated. But He chooses to give us a chance to be redeemed. Praise God. <clears throat> we need a spiritual Savior also. If you go talk to the world, oh, we need a political Savior. We need a social Savior. We need to correct these things. No, what we need is a spiritual Savior. Because see, what's at stake is our very souls. The problems we see in this world are because we are sinful. We live in a fallen creation. But God is still there. He still cares. He's still right through it all. So when you get a stomach flu and it hits you all of a sudden and you can't control any direction that it's going, literally, you think, wow, what an awesome God. Because I'm not this way 99.99% of the time. He made me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made and He didn't mess it up. Think about man and all their wisdom and their glory and everything. If they tried to design life, how many failure attempts they would have. And of course they never would. And how many bugs you have to work out. If we had a mediocre God, then every day you got up, you'd be like, what's going on? I can't control whatever. But you don't, do you? Because most of the time you get up and everything is fine because you were fearfully and wonderfully made by a Creator who loves you. Don't forget that. And He deserves our praise and our glory. Then you walk outside and see everything in creation, even in a fallen world, and you say, how can I not bring praise to God and honor Him for what He's done? And then if you read God's Word, and you see all the things we've done and, and our adherence to try to, to live by the law, and we can't do it at all. We desperately need a Savior, and He did that. He sent Himself. He humbled Himself. That Christ didn't think equality was God was something to be used for His service. Instead, He humbled Himself and gave up His life for ours on the cross. What a wonderful, wonderful God. So this world needs a Savior. It needs what we call salvation. But what does that mean to you? What about your salvation? We flippantly use that word all the time and say, Are you saved? What does that mean? And the world doesn't know what we mean. They just say, oh, there's a religious nut. <laughs> Am I saved? Saved from what? In this case, like I said, an eternity from hell. And the only Savior that's going to do that saving is Jesus Christ. And the end result of our salvation is forever with our God for all eternity. So how can we be quiet? How can we not sing praises? How can we not let it be known? So I entitled this message, Salvation, the Message of Foolishness. Because isn't that biblical? Isn't that what it says? It's a message of foolishness to this world. How could God, in all of His omni omniscience, send His Son to die for us? Why did He not just come down and, and demand justice? But He came as a humble servant. And lay down his life. What a foolish story of unconditional love. Last week we talked about blessed assurance and how a blind young girl who lost her father, lost her mother, could sing of this blessed assurance she had that Jesus was her Savior. Did you think about that? Did you think about the covenant that you read in the back of the hymnal? Hopefully if you didn't, take it home again and read it. And New Year's resolutions, if you, if you made a uh, New Year's resolution to lose some weight, did you make covenants and in in resolutions for how you're going to live your life with God? And much more important than the weight you can lose. You can lose some weight from just being sick. <laughs> Not a good way to do it, but you can do it. And whatever you set out to do those goals, they're not necessarily easy. They're going to be tough. They're going to have to take some, some initiative. I mentioned to you that Paul wrote in Philippians 2.12 that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Are you doing that? Are you willing to do that? What changes need to be made? And Peter told us in 1 Peter 1.9 that we are obtaining the outcome or the end result of our faith, not our works, our faith, the salvation of our very souls. 
So what does that mean? I want to look at it a little bit more and we're going to get in some definitions. Salvation is saving or deliverance from what? From a danger or a peril or destruction. The word involves an act of saving. Someone has to do that saving. They have to protect you and deliver you. So that the one being saved has been taken from a situation of peril to a situation of victory. And in this case, we can't do it our own. We have to have a Savior from outside. We have to have Jesus. So if you read your New Testament and you go through some of the words and you see Savior and you see save, being saved and saving and salvation, what do those mean? Well, the first word I want to mention to you is sotar. It's a masculine noun. It means Savior. And nowhere in the Bible does it say there's any other name given among heaven, given to men, whereby you must be saved other than Jesus Christ. Because He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. He is that Savior. He does everything that I just talked about. He goes to a person in peril. He saves them and delivers them up to a point of victory. And you may not think that as you're going through that part of being saved because you're still in here in this earth. You're still facing things. You still get sick. And there's so many things that we don't face because we are so blessed. We don't get up, like I said, every morning. And, is there oxygen for me to breathe today or do I have to put on a mask? God is so loving to His children. Even after they've rebelled and said, I don't want any part of your rules and regulations. They're too stuffy for me. Let me give you an example. We'll go with this example, and it's a very weak example because it doesn't compare at all to the godly perspective. But if you're in peril and you're drowning, physically drowning, okay, you've passed the point where you can do about anything about it yourself because you are drowning. If something does not happen, you're going to take in more water, not have oxygen, and you are going to die. Otherwise, you're not drowning. Okay? So if you are drowning, if you are guilty of sin against God Almighty and deserve eternal punishment, that's what the consequences are, then you are drowning. You have to realize that first because if you're drowning, you certainly want someone to come save you, don't you? See, the problem is, is most of the time we don't think we're drowning. We think we're still okay. I've only gone down for two or three times. I still got some oxygen. I'll be all right. I don't want a Savior. I can do it on my own. But if you're drowning, if you're that drowning man, you'll welcome a Savior. Well, there's another verb or another noun you need to know, and it's called sotere. It means salvation. It is God's rescue, deliverance of believers out of the destruction and peril that they're in which is eternal hell, eternal separation from God. You broke His commands. Yes, every one of us. <laughs> That's why you started out with the example. I have sinned this week. I know I have. I need a Savior. The end result is that salvation of my very soul that we just talked about. That point of safety. I am rescued from the peril that I'm in, and I have reached this point of safety. But where are we at in all that in-between time? What are we supposed to do with our lives? Oh, well, we've got the example of the thief of the cross. If, if you believe he didn't have an opportunity to do anything, Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. But see, you're still here. You're still breathing. God created you. He redeemed you back for a purpose. So are you living out that salvation with fear and trembling? That's that in-between time. It's not by works of righteousness which I have done. It's all according to faith. But James says, show me your faith without your works because it's dead. So my son, he's not here today, so he'll love this example. He said today, and that's part of my sin, as I got angry and said something I shouldn't have said. The anger wasn't the problem, but what I said was wrong. And I went to him because I listened to, to the Word of God repeating in my head. I said, don't let your anger go down. Go to bed at night with something still. So I had to go apologize to him for what I said. Oh, I wanted to not. <laughs> oh, how I wanted to not to apologize to him. Because he was very disrespectful and stuff to me. But that doesn't matter what he did. He's accountable for his own sins. He didn't make me do it. The devil didn't make me do it. I did it. 
But we have to decide what we're going to do with the sin in our lives. Do we need a Savior? And I thought, and like I said, am I going to be that hypocrite? Or am I going to go to Him? Doesn't matter what He does to back to me. doesn't make any difference. It matters what I do with what this Word tells me. That working out my salvation in fear and trembling. Amen. And then, as I'm obedient, I think of all these wonderful things, how God has blessed me with such a wonderful son, whether he ever speaks ugly to me or anything else. And I start praising God even more for the blessings of children, for my marriage, for the church. It just starts going everywhere. Whether than me letting that sin sit in there and seed and fester like a cancer. <clears throat> There's another word. Well, let me tell you some more about salvation. I've got the, the definitions from Blue Letter Bible from the, uh, what they say. It's deliverance, perseverance, per preservation, sorry, safety, salvation, deliverance from molestation of enemies. In an ethical sense, that which concludes to the soul's safety or salvation. Salvation at the present possession of all true Christians. Future salvation, the sum of benefits and blessings which Christians redeem from all earthly ills will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummated and eternal kingdom of God. A little more thought process there. Let me give you the example again. This is the drowning man who was going down for the last time that Jesus, well, in the case of a drowning man, that whoever came in and saved him. Then he reached this point back here or over here, where he's not on the boat. That's safe. But he's back at home with his family, his friends, everything else. He's reached that point of salvation. And that's why I said that's nothing in comparison. Because see, these are all castles built on sand again. Our salvation is 100% for sure if we believe. Nothing can ever take that away from us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is through Christ Jesus our Lord, is what Paul Christ. writes in Romans. We cannot imagine how wonderful it will be. We know that there will be no more tears, no more sickness, no more death, but we cannot imagine how glorious and wonderful it will be. That's the end result, our salvation. So it's sitting at home eating a nice big burger and drinking a glass of sweet iced tea with our children running around and our grandchildren running around. All is good. Oh, it's so much more than that. Here's a couple uses of that word. Philippians 2.12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as we have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. 1 Peter 1.9 says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your very souls. That's what we're working, longing for. That's the obligation that Paul talks about that we have, not to the sinful desires of the flesh, but to the gospel message, this message of foolishness to the world. There's another one. It's a verb, another word, sozu. Properly, it involves two things, to deliver, to deliver out of danger, and then place over into safety. Because see, you have all this point from here in between. I was in peril, I was dying, I was doomed. And now I'm in eternal bliss. But there's that period in between. And see, the difference between the drowning man is the drowning man, he doesn't even have to reach out and get the life preserver. The Savior can come around and grab him and pull him to safety and put the life back in him by mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But in part of spiritual... See, you're an active part in it. You have to decide to believe. And if you decide to believe, and you truly believe, then your life should surely show it, right? It should be obvious. Back to my son, he texted me later and said, Dad, I'm sorry for what I said. I texted him back and said, I don't really think so, because your actions don't show it. That's where he's going to be mad at me. 
but his actions don't show it. Now, I'm sure later on he'll understand and everything else. And, that, and that, that, like I said, we're fine. But what I did was what I have to worry about because I have to give an account for me. And I'm also an example for him. So, yeah, I make mistakes. I'm a sinner. But what happens after that? We all fall down and get up. Look at David again. A man after God's own heart. Look at the things that he did. Look at the Psalms that he writes. And it had to take Nathan coming up to him. and <laughs> Let me tell you a story. Because I'm afraid for my life. About this guy. That, that's you, David. You're that sinner. Oh, I am. I sinned against you, God. And only you. So he was a man after God's own heart. It's what we do to work out that salvation. This last one, this verb, sozu, means that we're delivered out of danger and brought into safety. It is used for God's rescuing believers from the penalty and power of sin into His safe and loving arms forevermore. It means to, to save, to keep safe and sound, to rescue from danger or destruction, to save a suffering one from perishing, suffering from disease, to make well, to heal, to restore, to preserve one who is in danger of destruction, to deliver from the penalty of God's holy justice and judgment, to save from evils which obstruct the reception into God's deliverance. <clears throat> Are you understanding the different meanings of saved, being saved, needing a Savior? Here's how that word is used. Matthew 121, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save that act of doing his people from their sins. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto those which are being saved, it is the power of God. Biblical salvation is the deliverance from eternal punishment and separation from God. Because of who God is, not because of who we are. Because of His love for us. Because His love is more than our rebellion. His love is so much greater than that. We rebelled against God our Creator and we deserve eternal punishment. But He offers us life if we will choose to receive it. It comes free of charge, but at an ultimate cost. To all who will receive this free gift, but how do you value it? It's full payment for our crimes against God. To receive, you must simply accept it in faith. The end result is the salvation of your very soul for all eternity. Forevermore as God's child. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You're even given the Spirit of God to actually reside inside of you, to seal you, to provide for you, to nourish you, to lead you, to comfort you. So that you're never, ever alone. But you must choose to submit to that power. You must choose to let your life, your will become less so that His can become more. With a goal of growing and maturing in Christ to be more like Christ. As you eagerly anticipate His return to take you forever home to that salvation that's why we rejoice that's what church is about it was 53 degrees in tri-cities and sunshine when I left yesterday there that was nice <laughs> I got to listen to Moody on the way down and listen to songs and stuff and, and one of the things I realized again because I realized it plenty of time is you know this world does desperately need a savior and even the church doesn't understand what their function is. I even listening to Moody programming, I was like, this is not what church is about. 
Church is this body of believers, those who have chosen to accept Jesus Christ, to live out this foolish gospel message, which is the power of God unto salvation. And we come together in church not to be filled, not for what we can get out of it. And he was talking about all these programs and things that church should provide. When we are the body of Christ coming together to influence each other positively because of the gifts the Spirit has given us in times of weakness, in times of joy, in teaching, in humility, so that we can be the body of Christ, which Scripture clearly gives us, to be His hands and feet. Not so we can see, how can I be treated? Oh, stomach. No, my stomach serves me. It's not been doing too well this last week, but because God is in control, it will. That's what church is about. That's what we're called to be, that body of believers. And I thank and praise God for each and every one of you. <clears throat> Jesus said it this way. And we like to quote John 3, 16. But He told Nicodemus, without him even asking, He said, you must be born again. In John 3, 3, He said, Very truly I tell you, listen up, this is the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Now two verses later, he says it a little differently. He says that no one can enter unless they're born again of water and of the Spirit. See, play in church, play in Christian isn't going to do it for anybody. You're going to miss the mark. You have to have a Savior. You're not even going to see the kingdom of God, let alone reside in it, unless you believe that Jesus Christ came to save you from your sins, and your life reflects that. Because you can say you're sorry all day long, and I'm not going to believe you unless your actions show it. And that's the same way with our faith. We don't have to have works of righteousness, but we surely should and will if our faith is genuine. To reach the end result of our salvation, so Tara, you must believe and yield to put your total trust and obedience in Jesus, your Master, your Teacher, your Lord, your Savior, the Soder, so that He can save, sozo, your very soul. That's what it's about. As long as you live, as long as you're breathing, your life should reflect Jesus Christ if you truly believe. So we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians. When I first started studying it, I was like, oh, okay, this is that letter Paul wrote to this troubled church. <laughs> but the more that I read it, the more I'm like, boy, there's so much here. And I want to turn there and read some of it, and I hope it entices you to learn more that you'll come on Sunday evenings. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be His holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of His grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way with all kind of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called us into the fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to stop there a second. There's so much right there. So much that Paul is telling them in just those few verses. Who they are in Christ, what they have to look forward to, that they've been given every spiritual gift, that God is so gracious, and we'll dive into that. But there's just so much there. So then he says in verse 10, I appeal to you, I beg you, See this, brothers and sisters, those who say that you believe. <clears throat> In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another 
in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Now there were some divisions in the church in Corinth. <laughs> There's some divisions in the body of the Christ everywhere, isn't there? And so many of the commentaries and stuff concentrate on that. But I think you're missing the point when you concentrate on that. It's all about who you are in Christ again. And we're going to end up in verse 18 in a second where we started. This is the problems you're seeing because you're letting the world distract you. And this is a result. It's not about the problems again. It's about the Savior and being saved for the end result of salvation. If we focus on that, these little problems will work themselves out by the power of God. The message of the cross, the foolish message of love. <clears throat> I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind, mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, <clears throat> Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul the one crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Oh, yes, I also baptized the house of household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. See, so many of us are afraid to go out and talking to others because we don't have enough biblical knowledge and we don't have the gift of preaching and, and so forth or teaching, or anything else. So God surely can't use me. He just said, I came to you not of learned, but with simplicity. Not because of me, but because of the message that I'm sending. So when someone does see that light in you, see those good works that glorify God, and they say, hmm, then the Spirit, the power of God will give you anything and everything that you have and need to say. And it's not about what you said. Again, it's about what the Spirit does. Go read Peter's first sermon. It's just some statement of facts. Don't get me wrong. But when you see it, and 5,000 people were saved. It's about the power of God, the message of this gospel, and you being willing and desiring because of what God did for you to tell others of that salvation. Verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, to those, it is the power of God. So is that message foolishness to you? Or is it the power of God? Your life will show it, not your words, your deeds what you do for others, the love that you have, to love even your enemies. That concept becomes more and more, huh, that's what that means, is you start going more and more in the Word and, and praying and becoming more like Christ and growing and working out your salvation. Do you have an upside, that comes from the movie, down view of the message of the cross? The world does, and they think it's foolish. The next verse is Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, says, For it is written, that's in the Old Testament in Isaiah 29, 14, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. All those things you thought were so important that you were trusting upon become castles built on sand. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Now, I don't know if you've noticed in there so far, but we've got the salvation process still there. But we have two things that contradict each other. Wise and foolish. Intelligent and unwise. Learned and unlearned. 
Godly and ungodly? Saved and unsaved? There's two individuals here. The ones who the cross, the message of the cross is foolish and those that the message is the power of God and they're the ones that are being saved. Verse 22 says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the rest of the world. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God. We see it again. And the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Now if you want to learn anything about wisdom, where would be a good place to start? There you go. Let's go there. We're just going to read a few of these. You can follow along if you want to, but these are just so wonderful to read from time to time. And I suggest reading a psalm or a Proverbs every day along with whatever else you read. Proverbs 1 starts out this way, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, they're for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instructions in prudent behavior, God, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to, to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding Proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, Solomon was the wisest man ever. Why? Because of his own might? No, because God gave him that wisdom. And even with the wisdom he gave us and the instructions he gave us, he was still very foolish because you've got to rely on on God. You've got to serve Him with your whole heart. Or we tend to go back to our own wisdom, even when we wrote it down. So he writes on in Ecclesiastes that all of that, this world that he pursued was nothing but meaningless. In Proverbs 3 he writes, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Those who hold her fast will be blessed. In the very next proverb, Proverbs 4, he writes, Listen, my sons, to your father's instructions. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teachings. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, Take hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. I don't know if you noticed on your bulletins, and Sherry did these while I was gone, choose your love. Love your choice. Isn't that so true? <laughs> and I like the little cartoon one with the power of the cross. He's drowning. The analogy I gave you, he says, you're crazy. I don't see how that'll save you. And the guy's grabbing on the cross, but it's a submarine under, bottom, under the bottom. It's got a stable structure, even though a submarine moves. You get the point. It's funny because he can't see what's under that water. We think we see things one way, but we have it upside down so often. Write these two Proverbs down. Okay, that means you need a pen. And I want you to read them. Proverbs 8, 1 through 11. And Proverbs 28, 4 through 14. Again, that's Proverbs 8, 1 through 11. And Proverbs 28, 4 through 14. And I'm going to ask you next week if you read them. I just gave you a sampling. Get wisdom. Because see, there's wisdom... Or there's foolishness. That's what we've just learned. 
Jesus had something else to say also about wisdom. Matthew chapter 7, his first sermon to the masses, his first per- public sermon that we know of. Verse 24, he says, Therefore anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on that stable structure, that rock. So when the rains came down, the stream rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. But everyone who fears, who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is the opposite. Not wise, but foolish. Foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Wisdom, foolishness, life, death. Being saved, not being saved. You know, those were right after Jesus spoke these words, if you're not familiar with it. We're just going to back up a few verses. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. See it or enter it. We already talked about that in John but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, clearly, so they'll understand there is no gray. I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. If you're relying on anything, any view you have that's upside down, the cross is the only way to reach God. Because He loved you and sent His Son to die for you. And your life should reflect that if you truly believe it. So we're to work out our salvation wisely. The church in Corinth was much like the church in this world today who thinks programs or watered-down messages are the way to go. But the way of the message is the foolishness of the cross. And that's what we're going to preach and live by here. Because it is the power of God in your salvation and in the salvation to others. It's the way, the truth, and the life. I want to close looking at 1 Corinthians 1.18 again. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You have two things here again. You have those perishing and those who are being saved. You have the message of foolishness and you have the power of God. Do you see anything in between here? What does your life show and how does it reflect? Because it's one or the other. It is black or white. You're saved or you're not saved. And that's why I said last week that I want to start out with, with that as always. What is your relationship with God and how are you working out your salvation? There's only two choices. So I pray that you're working out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you don't know that, if it... If there's any doubt, you know what? All you've got to do is go to your Heavenly Father and talk to Him and set things right. It's that simple. He loves you and cares for you so desperately. But like the drowning man analogy again, you've got to take hold of that gift that's being offered you. He's not going to drag you to safety. That's how we were created in His image above the animals. We have the choice to accept God or not through Jesus Christ. And we have the choice to live that life that He's called us to live and work out our salvation or not. To those who are being saved, the message of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. Father, we thank You so much for who You are, for Your love, that You provide a way for us and that you do the saving all along the way. Lord, help us to take hold of Jesus and help us to take hold of the life that you have given us anew. That we are born again. That the power of sin and the penalty of sin 
is no longer applicable to your children. We thank you and praise you. May your spirit fill this place and dwell each and every one of us as we take a hold and we respond in faith to our belief in Jesus Christ. Be with those that aren't able to be here today, Lord. And we thank you for this church. We thank you for the freedom that we do have. We thank you for the fact that you have given us a church here on earth so that we can just get a glimpse of what heaven will be like. May we look forward to that day with eager anticipation and with the hope that we profess in Christ Jesus. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.